Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about kind of implementing this here at UK and kind of what I went through. And like Jeff alluded to, it does take a lot of time. Um, and so kind of share some of my practical experience of things that I did. I got introduced to OER when we started with the uh, Coursera MOOCs. Uh, and we were looking for a resource to refer students to because this was an open course. We wanted students to have materials available to them. And we, it was pre-open stacks. Um, so finding a resource for students to use um, was kind of a challenge. So that's when we started seeing more and looking more into um, OER materials. And so we also have those courses that are available. So when I did this, the course I kind of looked at as the, the best option and the one that most needed something different was actually the course Chem 103. And this is my pre-nursing class. I'm the only person that's taught this class for the last five years. There's one section. It's all me. So I didn't have to get buy-in necessarily from other faculty. And I didn't have to get everybody to agree to it because it was just me. I could do whatever I want. So. Um, these are pre-nursing students, so I get that they are a little bit more motivated than many of other first-year students, especially in chemistry. They know an A or B in this class is required, or they're not getting into nursing school. So motivation is definitely makes life easier. Um, it is a one-semester course where we cover general organic and biological chemistry, so we are at the very shallow end of the pool with lots of different topics. And this is also the only chemistry course they will take before they go into nursing school. So I did have a lot of flexibility. I geared this course very much to um, things that I think are going to help them are with the nursing faculty to say, okay, what are they weakest on when they get into these classes so we can focus on that so I don't have to have a set curriculum. Um, if you go to a general chemistry course in, in pretty much anywhere in the country, if you tell me they're doing traditional or atoms first, I can tell you exactly what they're covering and exactly what order, and I can probably quote chapter numbers for every book because they're all the same. Um, so I have about 200 to 250 students a semester. Um, this is actually a picture of our nice new Jacobs Science Building, which I am very fortunate to, um, to reside in and get to teach in now. Um, and so my classes are now completely active learning spaces. So looking at materials, they needed to have something that was very accessible, not only cost-wise, but also accessible to these students to be able to read and something that was at their level with what they needed. Um, and so that, but this is a picture of my class in their, in their group work. Um, I love my, if you haven't been to the Jacob Science Building, please let me know. I'd be happy to give you a tour. We're, we're like little kids at Christmas still going, ooh, look at this. So, um, so the reason I kind of looked at the change for this course was um, this GOB course is taught in a variety of formats. Here at UK, we teach both a one-semester version and a two-semester version for two very different groups of students. And that's pretty typical at many universities. But the content that's covered in this sequence is very different depending on your audience. Uh, when we teach general chemistry, everybody teaches the same thing. We're kind of governed by American Chemical Society that say you cover these topics and we all do that. The GOB sequence is very geared towards the majors you have in that class. So there's not a lot of books out there as there are for, say, general chemistry. Um, and they need to be at the appropriate level. The book that's written for the two-semester sequence is so not appropriate for the one-semester course because there's a lot of extra stuff in there that can be very overwhelming to students. Chemistry is already overwhelming. I don't need to contribute to that by giving them more than they need. Um, I also change the way things are covered a lot in general chemistry. It's pretty much two approaches. GOB, we cover things very differently, and I want to cover it in a way that makes sense to me, a way that's going to make sense to students, and the way that I can kind of contribute to uh, and building into their, their nursing classes later on. So I wanted to be able to customize that order. When I was using a traditional textbook, it was like, okay, we're going to cover chapter 6.2, and then 7.4, and then 1.3, and it was just really overwhelming to students to do that. Um, and then, the, obviously, the cost issue. Uh, and that was a big thing. So um, I covered up the publisher. I also put a quarter there for it to mention. So this textbook, um, and, um, there's nothing wrong with the book. It was a great book. They had great resources. It was well written. But it wasn't in the order I liked it. And new cost $165 for this book that was the width of a quarter. Um, and students were reporting out when they sit, be there. They didn't buy it. They bought used. They shared. Average student cost was about $85 for them, or they rented. This is not a book that's a reference book for students. Okay? So I looked up the price. This is an old edition of the CRC handbook that's the reference Bible for chemists. Um, the new edition of this cost a little over $100. And this is a book that you get and you keep. I've had this for 20 years. I still use it and you keep it forever. It's a reference book. And I, we might pay 100 bucks for it. A textbook for $165, and it doesn't even have things the way I want them, just seemed a little excessive. And so um, I just wanted to get something that would be usable. And so this was kind of one of the selling points for students, because there was resistance. As they've mentioned, uh, people at 
want a paper copy. They're very ingrained with that paper copy. So this was kind of my big selling point for students going, hey, look at all this money you're going to save. And they began to see the benefits of the um, online book and the open book. But this was definitely a selling point for them. Um, for finding OER, there are more options now for general chemistry books. For GOB, not so much. So finding the content that was usable and had what I needed and where I needed it, how it needed to be approached um, was a big issue. Accuracy is an issue. Jeff mentioned like Khan Academy and Khan Academy has some fantastic videos. There are also some errors in Khan Academy videos as there are in any videos, as there are in anything I, you know, there, there are errors, right? And so, but I had to make sure we could get something that was accurate as possible. And if there was an error, there was something I could fix and make better. Um, and it also needs to be readable. I use the um, active learning format in my classroom, and I use a lot of online video lessons with integrated questions, but there are things where I say, you just need to go and read and be responsible for this. We're not going to discuss it in class. I'm not going to put a video on it. We're going to see problems on the homework on it. It's going to be on the exam. And granted, these topics tend to be more basic content that is in there, but it needs to be something that's readable by these students at this level. Um, so it has to be at something they can understand because many of, some of them have no background in chemistry, some of them have a very limited background, so it really needs to start at the very uh, lowest level. As I mentioned, we cover a lot of topics at very shallow levels. And so we, I tell my students we stay at the shallow end of the pool when we cover this class. Um, and we also don't deal with a lot of the gray areas. So in chemistry, as in with any subject, there's the black and the white and there's all this gray in the middle. We don't, I don't focus on the gray. I'm like, we worry about the, the big rules and we don't worry so much about the exceptions and the, the rare occasions. So we're covering a lot of stuff and we don't want to go too in depth because we can get down that rabbit hole and never um, get out of it. So the resources that were kind of available when I started looking at this, um, trying to develop this book, were OpenStax, which was coming out with the chemistry book, but it um, was definitely the content level that was too high for my students. Uh, LibreText, which used to be known as the Chem Wiki, um, and it didn't have a lot of content that I had some, but I was going to be having to write a lot more and to adapt to that. And I found CK12, which is clearly intended for K through 12 education, but at the level this course has taught a lot of the advanced high school chemistry books overlap with what I was covering. There were some gaps in there, uh, but there were minimal gaps so that I could cover that, I could write some material. Um, and so that's where I actually started out was on ck12.org. I took things that were already there, I edited them the way I wanted them, I added images, um, like the search.creativecommons.org was my best friend that Jeff mentioned to find images that I could use. Um, and so I started out on that, and it worked, okay, fine. It was great. It was web-based. The students could access it anywhere. Um, they, I could generate a PDF very easily, so if they wanted it offline, if they did want a print copy, they could print out what they needed, although even though most of them said at the beginning they would want to print it out, at the end very few said they actually did. Um, and there was a lot of content. I could also pull in um, some biology content on there, so for things that are overlapping between chemistry and biology. The com was the editor, worked, but it was not the greatest editor, and so it had some quirks about it that could get very frustrating. And there were some issues that were the level of content wasn't sufficient. It was a K through 12 site. I, that was totally understandable. It was appropriate for that, but not necessarily for my course. And it became really hard to link to an individual page. And so what I do when I'm using um, the active learning, if there's a section they need to be responsible for on their own, I'll say, read this section. And if I couldn't link to that, it was like trying to describe where it was, where it's not a page number because it's online, and so it made some challenges for that. Um, but it worked, and that was the key thing. And I did was able to do editing. I was able to get the material I wanted to do. And I went to a conference um, at the beginning of August and went to a workshop on the Kim Wiki. And this was just this August, which is now known as LibreText. And they've got multiple subjects on there, primarily in the STEM fields. Um, and so I was talking to the workshop leader. I said, yeah, I've been using CK12, but I've been having some issues. And I love your editing option. This is so much easier. He goes, oh, will you switch if I move all your content for you? I said, absolutely. I'm like, this is, I'm, so he has a student team. He's funded by NSF grants. Um, and so we had a student who within a matter, so this was the beginning of August, like August 2nd, and by August 18th, I had 90% of my content moved over. Within another week, they got the few kind of smattering of things left. So before the semester started, they had transferred everything over, got it all set up, all formed, 
And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And so once they got it moved over, I was able to go in and make some edits and it was much easier. And so I'll just show you their website real quick. I want, and so I can link to the book, to the pages and all this good stuff. Um, but you can see, oops, we don't need to go to Microsoft. There we go. Um, they have various topics here. Um, the book is all here. The editing is easy. It's chapters and they even added some more images because I was missing some images on my chapter pages. Um, and so everything is there. And so when students go into a chapter, they can actually see, here's each of the sections. There's a set of exercises that are in there. Um, and it's even got subsections. So I can even nail down to a specific. I'm saying, oh, I want them to go to this particular section. There's lots of anchors. So it's set up very well for students to use. It's fairly small chunks of information. Um, so they're not getting overwhelmed with that. Okay. So where do I want to go from here? Because I don't think this project is by any means done. That's the virtue of having this open material that it's easily editable. I want to continue to improve this. This is a living document. I had a student, I was in class one day and we're walking, they're working on their problems and their active learning activities. And I walked around the student goes, is this number right in this table? Is this something, this doesn't make sense. I'm like, oh yeah, that is a typo. So I went after class and fixed it. And so I'm like, I can't do that with a traditional print textbook. So I can make those things. Our students are going, you know what, this, I read this, but I don't get it. I'm not sure, and we'll talk about it some more. I'm like, you know what, I think I'll add this part in there. And I can go make those changes on the fly. And now that it's kind of set up, it's, it's uh, much easier to do. So I still want to work on improving the content. I still know there are typos in there that I'm still working on. Um, I want to add more practice problems and solutions manual, which is what I was trying to... Uh, the UK Library's alternate textbook grant is now helping with so that I could get some extra people to help me with. Um, this was something I just did on my own. I did not have funding for this, uh, which will explain the editor, one of my editors on the next page. Um, and we have offered OpenStax as an alternative to students for our general, general chemistry courses. Uh, we continue with an old edition of a textbook this year, uh, but we offered that up. We gave a correlation guide that says this section is this section, so they can use that. So if they don't can't afford a book, they do have that option. And OpenStax is definitely in our on our short list when we review textbooks again this spring for next year. Um, so that is on our short list of books to look at and see. Um, that's not all my decision though, so that's a committee decision, so it's not up to just me like the course for 103. Um, I do want to thank the Department of Chemistry because they've been great supporting me uh, and saying, you want to do this? Go for it. They don't necessarily give money, but they, they I had lots of moral support and lots of things I wanted to do, and they weren't, you know, they, they saw that it was a, a useful thing and, and as well. Um, UK Library is the alternative textbook grant, so I can start working on some other parts of this project. Um, my solutions manual for the book is now um, handwritten in literally a, like a one subject notebook and I scanned it and posted pick, you know, posted that as a PDF online. So I'd like to get something that looks a little more professional looking for my students. It works, but it's not the greatest. Um, and this is actually my daughter, Megan Salt. One, because teenagers will do anything for not that much money. I was able to pay. <laughs> uh, it's amazing what they'll do. Uh, so actually, I, I paid her to um, transcribe a lot of my editing because I had printed the PDF of the book. And so as I was traveling that summer, um, I was making notes and post-its and scribbling. And so um, while she complained that there were some times she could not read my handwriting for certain things because I would get excited and write really fast so she couldn't read it. Because um, when you're excited, you write fast and you want to get all those ideas down. Um, so she figured out how to navigate and figure out all my abbreviations that I use in chemistry, like I use NRG for energy and things like that. So she's now learned a plethora of abbreviations that we use in sciences, uh, even though she has no interest in going into the science field herself. Uh, but she did, thankfully, uh, figure out all my, my scribbles and dealt with a lot of the editing. So a lot of the frustration with the editor was her problem and not my problem. <laughs> But again, she at the time was 16. It was money, and so she was more than happy to do that. So, all right, and so and that's it. So I'll turn.